uh, the evangelizing parish. What I'm hoping is, as we go through this, that you'll see that we've got some kind of a balance between uh, right brain and left brain. I think uh, our keynote speaker this morning did very well in uh, doing that for us, helping us to deal with images and concepts at the same time. I also think it's important to say that uh, as we go through this, myself kind of presenting seminal ideas, that is to say seeds, that I'm hoping that as you go on through the rest of the workshops and uh, on your way home driving, uh, some of those seeds may take root and you yourself may begin to uh, you know, foster their growth and see what they're calling you to. But the fact of the matter is I hope that what we're doing here together is kind of engaging so that later on, after having thought about it and half of it, you know, uh, talk to someone else about it, you may end up getting confused being able to say, well, I don't know if he said it or I thought it, but this is what I came away with. So in other words, uh, I don't want you to look upon this as a, a lot of information that you have to involve yourself in, but rather an experience that hopefully will uh, lead you into uh, dealing with this maybe a little bit more facilely yourself. The process I'm going to use is not, uh, you know, any kind of uh, flash cards or any kind of uh, visuals, but I thought I would just use sermons as we're talking about sermons, uh, preach about preaching. And uh, as we go through the workshop, I'll be just giving you excerpts of uh, sermons uh, to, to help uh, illustrate what I'm trying to say. The white sheet in front of you there is a, a sheet which just is uh, really the goals of uh, our time together this morning. I think it's important to tell you uh, that uh, that's what I'm thinking about and later on we can determine whether or not I uh, achieved it or you achieved it. So in other words, uh, the good thing about doing workshops as opposed to teaching in colleges and universities as I used to do is uh, you do the evaluation, I don't have to worry about it, okay? So, those uh, ideas there under homiletics of the evangelizing parish, that it's from faith to faith, it's an invitational thing, it's a process of discovery, discovering the presence of the power of God and our call to an ongoing conversion to that power. It's proclamation, and proclamation is affirmation. It's not just proclaiming something you don't have, but affirming what you do have. And it's the presence of God's kingdom that is truly here. That kingdom has come, and our job is the revelation, the uncovering, the affirmation of that kingdom of justice, love, and peace. We hear a lot, obviously, about the new evangelizing. And as we do that, I think it's important just to look at the top of the purple sheet there. Uh, Pope uh, John Paul II uh, told us in the uh, writings that he did and the preaching that he did about his hope for a new evangelization. It's only different from the old evangelization in three things. Uh, the mission is threefold, as it says there. Now it is to Christians, to those who are no longer Christian, and to those who have never been Christian. Heretofore, as it says in that paragraph above those three bullets, this new evangelization has a different mission. It can no longer be adequately divided between pastoral activity among Christians and missionary activities among non-Christians. So this question of new evangelization has to be understood first and foremost in uh, reference to the old evangelization. And the old evangelization was really this proclamation. For us here in the United States, there's kind of two uh, streams of how that has come down. One is through the, uh, the Bishops' Conference. Now you can go back to all kinds of publications that the Bishop Conference has been involved in. For instance, uh, Go and Make Disciples. Go and Make Disciples, a national plan and strategy for Catholic evangelization. Uh, it originally came out in 2002. It's 
It's been around, you know, for 12 years and uh, was reprinted in uh, 2012. It's one of those things that, uh, you know, is just right there for us. Another one is Disciples Called to Witness, the New Evangelization. And uh, that, again, came out from the Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis, and it goes back to the copyright of 2012. I'll just put these up here. You can look at them afterwards if you've never seen them before. But they're really basic reading to what we're all about from the bishop's point of view. Then there's all kinds of uh, popularizations. And I just grabbed one from the Knights of Columbus because the price is right. Uh, and that is, uh, what is the new evangelization? It can be very helpful in dealing with committees in a parish or in a diocese to give people a basic understanding of what we're talking about. It's also important to say, though, that there's been another way that the uh, stream of thought about evangelization has come down to us, and one of them is the reason I was asked to uh, preside here today. And that is uh, the forum, which is the North American Forum on the Catechumenate. How many people have ever heard of the North American Forum? Okay, several here. It was, I sadly have to say, because we closed our doors this last year, a, a group of uh, professionals, church professionals from around the country, who, with the services of an executive director, would put on workshops just about anywhere we were asked to uh, on how do you implement the RCIA? How do you implement uh, that reformed right of bringing people into the church, uh, that formalized question of conversion. And originally we did uh, seven day programs uh, back in the 80s. Uh, they were called Beginning and Beyond. And uh, they were great. Gradually as economics changed, as uh, people's time demands changed, it got cut back to five, then three. We're trying to do some things overnight. And we almost got to the point where we were, you know, uh, accomplishing very little, simply because people didn't have the time to come. But toward the end, we were expanding our list of possible workshops. And one of them was the evangelizing parish. And it's because of that that I've been asked to speak out of that experience of going around the country and doing these workshops on the evangelizing parish and helping people to see, not just from the bishop's point of view, but also from the scriptural point of view. Not that they're different, but they are two different approaches. And with that approach, we began to understand that we really had a situation in which the community called the parish could embody that very first step, that first stage of the uh, catechumenate, uh, which is called the stage of evangelization. So in that, we began to think of it more as a process. And that process, I think, is important to keep in mind as you look at the bottom of page, uh, the purple page. Because this from the Acts of the Apostles was one of the texts that was key to our workshop on the evangelizing parish. Because what it was trying to do was to help people go back to their scriptures, see what the definition of that early church was, looking at a community of faith, and then asking ourselves, how well do we do that today? And maybe our problem is not the means of, you know, evangelizing, but rather the real challenge is, can we be the community that we were called to be that calls more people into itself? So we used to talk about those four marks of the church that were involved in that early uh, Christian community. Uh, those who believed, verse 44, shared all things in common. They would sell their property and goods, divided everything on the basis of each one's needs. 
So the idea of community, of support for one another. Also, uh, 46, they went to the temple area together every day while in their homes they broke bread. They took their meals in common, praising God, winning the approval of the people. Day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So we would go around the parish, the country, helping parishes gather together in teams to ask the simple question, how well do we do in 2014? What that first Christian community did when it gathered, how well do we support each other? How close is our community? How vibrant is our prayer? How joyful is our liturgy? How great is our outreach? And how much do people see and experience an attraction to what and who we are? And that question of being there, you know, is important because a lot of times people talk about going out and proclaiming who you are, and it always reminds me of the, uh, you know, the Magnificat, in which uh, Mary said, my being proclaims the greatness of the Lord. So when we talk about a parish going out to evangelize and proclaiming to the world, it has to understand that what it is first and foremost proclaiming is its own being. We have to be a parish with vibrant liturgy, with committed social justice programs, with outreach to the needs of others, with support of those within. All of those things have to be there so that when I evangelize, I can go out and proclaim the being of my parish. Otherwise, we go out there and we stumble because we don't have that being to proclaim. It's another way of saying what uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi is supposed to have said, you know, which was proclaim or preach always, and when necessary, use words. So we have to begin to look at our parish and say, okay, this parish, whether it wants to or not, is proclaiming, preaching by being. So we think about that, and we think about it, and uh, that draws me to look at the invitational aspect of uh, the evangelization process, and that's on uh, the yellow sheet. I brought this because sometimes, you know, it's so easy to say, well, you have to be a welcoming parish. Do you have a welcoming ministry? Do you have welcomers at your liturgy? Uh, and it becomes a, a little bit, you know, of another thing to check off. What we have to begin to see very clearly is that welcome is really first and foremost, as all evangelization is, a work of God. It's a work of the Lord. The church is the body of Christ. It's not the body of just its members. But the members are imbued with the Spirit, and that membership brings us together, and together we present Christ to this world. So the one thing I liked about this yellow sheet is it was used several years ago at a time we were just kind of getting the new translations going in the liturgy, but it's very clear that invitation is the work of Christ. Yes, we are doing the inviting, but we are doing it in his name. As you look through this, let me just read with you the first two paragraphs. On behalf of our parish community, I welcome you to the celebration of Christmas. Let me remind you that the English-speaking world began using a new translation of the Mass text on the first Sunday of Advent. If you haven't been to Mass during Advent, or even if you have, let me encourage you to make use of the worship page to help you participate on the lower level uh, the, uh, the yellow sheets can help you. Now, notice, this was a great time that, that a lot of people can get a jab in. Whoa, you finally come back to church, and since you were here last, we've changed everything. And you rub it in their face. This is inviting. 
It's saying, you know, you're here, that's great, but now we want to help you to make the best of it. Then, as you go through this, the next section.
Rather, I'm proclaiming what you do have and what you're not aware of. And you need faith to accept. At the very end of that uh, page, it says that uh, the church exists in order to evangelize. So that means that everything we do, whether it's going to the foreign country or doing something in our own parish, it's, called, it's somehow evangelizing. So we have to, as we think about the parish now and the preaching in the parish, in the context of evangelization, say, a lot of times when we're preaching in the parish, we're evangelizing. We're helping people to understand what they already have, what is present in this community of faith, what exists in the body of Christ, and how we need to have that revealed more. <clears throat> Let me uh, just give you uh, one example. One example comes, you know, in the, we do it all on Sundays on those little baptisms of infants. And uh, one uh, text that I use quite often is the text of uh, Mark 10. Uh, people are bringing their little children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuke them. You probably can give that by heart after so many years. And uh, it says, uh, let the children come to me, do not prevent them. Uh, then he embraced them and blessed them. So here's the sermon I give. And I must say that before I give it, we have that little introductory right, you know, you ask the parents, what is the name of the child? What do you ask of God's church for this child? And then you say, uh, George, I uh, you know, welcome you into the Christian community. And I trace the cross of your forehead, and I invite your parents and godparents to do the same. One of the principles I have in the liturgy is not only that it doing what it tells you to do, but if it doesn't tell you not to do it, maybe you should think about it. So it doesn't say uh, that you shouldn't have everybody else come up and draw a cross on the forehead of the child. So if it's a small group, what I'll have is everybody comes up and they all get to trace a cross on the forehead. And then I give this little sermon on the idea of the... Uh, the baptism. I said, you know, there's only one difference between uh, what's happening here today in church and what happened 2,000 years ago in the Holy Land. Uh, people, parents here, are still bringing their children to Jesus so that Jesus might bless the child and embrace the child. Only one difference. 2,000 years ago, when those parents brought their children to Jesus, if they were embraced by Jesus, they would have felt the hairy arms of this Palestinian Jew. And if they were blessed by Jesus, they would have heard that Aramaic dialect that, that none of us has ever heard. The difference is that today, if this little infant is to be embraced by Jesus, it will have to be in our arms. And if this little infant is to be blessed by Jesus, it will have to be through our voices. So the fact is that when you read carefully, the ritual of the baptism of an infant, it's all about adults. And the commitment that the adults are making to this child. We are as crazy as it might seem, agreeing to be Christ for this child today. We are called through everything we say, all of our attitudes, all of our affection, to be Christ for this little one. And that's what we talk about in religious education when we say that faith is caught, not taught. You teach about faith, but faith itself is caught in a community of believers. So if this little one is ever to catch the faith, it depends on us. And today we make the commitment to this child to live the faith so that this child can have it. 
Now, I wish it were as simple as that little ritual at the very beginning when we all came up and traced a cross on the forehead of the baby. And then, with that cross traced, we could stand back and say, well, now it's St. George. But the fact is that St. George here has a, a free will. And like all of us, he's going to have to struggle with the faith. But he'll never even have a chance to struggle unless we ourselves give him that faith. So it's going to take a lot of hard work and sacrifice and example on our part. And it's also going to take prayer. And prayer is what we continue with then in the prayers of the faithful. So it's preaching within the parish, preaching in a sacramental moment, a teachable moment as we used to say. And it's the emphasis that what we're celebrating is already here in this community of faith. And what we're calling the community to is to share that faith. So I think it's important for us to be able to see that uh, this continues in many ways. It just isn't with dealing with children in a baptism. We have to be people who can say, okay, we're going to evangelize within the parish ourselves. And as we do that, one of the things might be uh, different programs that come up. I'm very happy that next year we're going to uh, have the theme of, uh, you know, the role, the baptismal role uh, for preachers. That means everybody who's baptized is called to be a preacher. Uh, when I did my doctorate in uh, preaching, uh, the project was the inauguration of lay preaching in a Roman Catholic parish. And uh, it works. Some of us have had experience in Curcio, Tech, Watch, Chirp, all kinds of programs in which lay people are called upon to preach. Now we'll give it different names, witness talks, or follow this outline and just put in some examples. But they're preaching. And in my own parish, from which I am now retired, uh, we used to do watch. And I did the uh, talk on grace. And one of the things I talked about was simply uh, my life. Because when we do theology, you know, one of the books of life in grace, and a recognition of God's presence in the world, but if we're really going to be calling people to transformation, they have to discover that for themselves. So we have to do a witness. We have to give them an example of how it works. <coughs> I talked to them, for instance, uh, about when I was in grade school at St. Pat's in Peoria. School sisters in Notre Dame, and every so often someone would come around one of the missionary orders and they'd be presenting, you know, from one of those 16 millimeter reels. They'd bring a uh, little film on their missionary work. And I was always impressed. We'd go to the basement of the school and see that. Uh, usually the film would splice a couple of times and have to be repaired, but uh, it was a great experience. But I always said to myself as I watched these pictures of Papua New Guinea, boy, that's wonderful, but I never want to do that because I never wanted to leave home. Then I remember going to a high school, high school taught by a small order, the Viatorians. And uh, toward the end of my uh, year there, as a junior, uh, one of the uh, priests approached me and said, you know, we know you're thinking about priesthood, but uh, we'd like to, you know, invite you to think about uh, becoming a, a Viatorian. We have colleges, we have, uh, you know, schools around the world, we have all kinds of educational aspects. I said, well, thanks, but I never want to be a teacher. And uh, then when he got to the senior year, I actually had on my desk at home the application form for the Capuchins. Any Franciscans here? The idea for me of the Capuchins was, these are the people who most 
closely follow the charism of Francis. And I loved Francis. Took his name for my confirmation. And as I did that, I always studied and studied to find out where was the truest expression of his charism. Now, I had never seen a Capuchin. I had never even been downwind of one. But I knew from my study that's what I wanted to be. So I go to confession, uh, as I used to do on a Saturday afternoon. Every afternoon, Saturday, you went to confession. So I'm there and uh, going to uh, Father Cain. At the end of the confessional, of course, in the black box, he said, Mike, afterwards, wait for me. I want to talk to you. Well, that's the first time I knew that he knew who I was. So I'm just shaking in my boots, wondering what this is going to be. He said, well, I've been talking uh, to the priest in the high school, and they say you're interested in the vocation and that you're thinking about, you know, a uh, religious order. I just want to say this, he said. Uh, you know, I know you're well, and uh, as far as uh, poverty goes, I think you can handle it. A chastity, he says, you'll do as well as the rest of us. Obedience, he says, is going to get you because you're too much of a free spirit. So we talked a while. And by the end of it, uh, I had an appointment with the chancellor <laughs> at the chancery for the following Monday. And that's how I became a diocesan priest. But jump ahead uh, to uh, 47 years old, through a series of different things, I wake up and I am teaching full-time at uh, St. Dominic's Seminary as a missionary in Lusaka, Zambia, living a community life with Jesuits, Franciscans, and Dominicans. And I said to myself, the transforming power of the grace of God. Most of us look upon it as a lightning bolt from heaven that knocks you, you know, off your horse, as Caravaggio uh, painted uh, St. Paul's conversion. And you're laying flat on your back and say, okay, I do believe. The fact of the matter is the transformative power of the grace of God often works gradually, just gradually in our lives. So, there I was in Africa, and ended up celebrating my 50th birthday in Africa as a missionary, full-time teacher, and uh, loving it. I mention it because for those people who come to that WATCH program, they have to be able to look at their lives, and the preaching in the parish has to help every person, not just keep concepts up here of faith, but to be able to look at their lives and to see what God is doing, where God is calling them, where God has already moved them. So what we do with the children or what we do with adults is very much all concerned with this idea of doing evangelization. So it's a vocation then of all the baptized because the people, once they hear this message and are uh, turned on to it, can then turn around and turn others on to it also. And I believe that that's going to be, you know, one of the waves of the future and probably one of the reasons why our processes of evangelization often trip. Because at some point in time, like a lot of things in the parish, it'll fall back to the pastor or the deacon or maybe the religious ed coordinator. But unless we see evangelization as the work of the community, the whole body of Christ, we're going to be in trouble. I want to say also that as we look through this, it's important to know that there's going to be shifts and on that blue sheet right in the middle we're called shifts in our understanding. That's one of the things we stressed in uh, the forum's work on the evangelizing parish. In order 
bring people's minds around from a negative view of evangelizing as maybe knocking on doors or speaking on a soapbox to a real understanding of what uh, the popes have been talking about and what the scriptures are talking about. We have to move from bringing outsiders in to simply proclaiming the presence of Jesus Christ. Doing that within our context of parish, doing it outside our context of parish. And rather than working on increasing membership, we're called to be people who really do evangelization, as that RCIA process calls us to, for the purpose of conversion. It's a vocation that has to change from the idea of the evangelization as a vocation of priests and religious to the vocation of all the baptized. Remember that uh, when we're anointed after baptism, we are anointed priests, prophets, and kings. So that prophecy, that proclamation of the will of God is our, all, all of our duties. It's a, the new evangelization calls us to move from an understanding of doctrinal delivery to the evangelical model of proclaiming the good news. And rather than being peripheral to the church, we have to begin to see it as being the very mission of the church in dealing with its own members and dealing with members outside of itself. It's interesting then that uh, as we do that, we'll discover that all of us are called to once uh, go back to that idea of the scriptures. Let me just mention another kind of uh, preaching that can go on. Sometimes preaching, you know, when we think about it, uh, and we fall back into the doctrinal uh, model, it becomes rather deadly. And uh, I have recently had a young assistant who is a, just a wonderful young man, but because he himself was never evangelized, uh, when he came into the seminary, the, the first year of the seminary for them was basic catechism. And he was so impressed by that that it's still what he feels he's called to give to others in preaching. And uh, it's deadly. Because while there's nothing wrong with the catechetical model, uh, you don't put it in the pulpit. You have to understand where it fits and where it doesn't fit. For me, it's very important to say that the idea of the preaching in evangelization is really that preaching that comes from what we have to call uh, either narrative, personal sharing, story, or uh, that which is more image than uh, concept. And people today are prepared to deal with that. I think it takes an awful lot more work to do it, to come up with image because I think all of us have studied long enough and repeated it often enough that we can just stand up and give a doctoral sermon. But to come up with the image that opens up the other side of the brain, that right side of the brain, where we find the art and the music that uh, Virgilio was talking about this morning, to be open to that, where people begin to deal with it themselves, coming on the right side of the brain, or the left side of the brain, the logical, all we do is keep things there in their you know, pigeonholes. But when it comes to the right side of the brain, and the images, then we begin to deal with it and integrate it ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves, are there ways that uh, we might do that? And. Uh, let me just give you one sermon that I used once to try to do this and uh, see what you think. It was based on Matthew uh, 25, you know, the separation of the sheep and the goats. And in the back of my mind I had Joel uh, chapter 2 
where he speaks about uh, young men have visions and old men dream dreams. And uh, I said, you know, after the gospel is written, that I myself have to admit that I've had dreams. Uh, dreams about, uh, you know, what uh, Matthew was talking about. And my uh, dream was this. I had uh, received an invitation in the mail uh, to my last judgment. And I decided, well, this is one thing I'm not going to miss. So I uh, kept the invitation with me uh, just to make sure I wouldn't miss it. And the morning of the invitation, uh, I went out to looking for the address. And uh, lo and behold, I couldn't find any place close to it. Uh, but I stopped in asking, you know, where is this address? And they said, well, it's over there. There's nothing on the door, though. Well, it was an old CD motel that, you know, had gone through two or three chains. And now it's in private hands uh, before it was probably torn down somewhere in the next five years. So I went up to the front desk and I said, you know, there might be a mistake here, but I have an invitation. And it's uh, to my last judgment that has this address. Oh, they said, you're right, you're early, uh, but uh, it'll be down the hall there. The hall, the uh, ballroom is on the right. Well, I was greatly relieved. So I decided, well, I'll walk down there and just check uh, what it's like uh, because uh, if I need to get a seat early, I better do that. So I'm walking down there, and uh, you know, it's one of those old corridors, which you can see just about everything over the last 10 years has been spilled on the carpet and kind of smoothed out as opposed to uh, cleaned off. And as I'm walking down there, I notice all the doors to the uh, ballroom are open. And uh, those ballroom doors have, uh, you know, various uh, entrances, but it all to the same ballroom. And when I went in there, Two things struck me. Number one, the old mirrors on all the walls and kind of the uh, silver behind the mirrors is already starting to peel off and you can't see too well in them. And the second thing is that it's totally empty except on the one end uh, where there's a door, another door coming in, uh, there's a platform, just about an eight inch platform, and uh, a single chair. Well, I just kind of go out and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and sure enough, finally, people start coming in. And as uh, fate would have it, every so often, I notice somebody and I can recognize them. And this one guy comes in, and he and I were in seminary together uh, you know, uh, 50 years ago. And uh, he was, we used to joke about him because he was uh, the perfect seminarian, never did anything wrong, volunteered for every position, got elected to anything he wanted because nobody else wanted it, and, uh, you know, just kept going. And he only lasted two years after ordination. We said, you know, there's a guy really called to be a lifetime seminarian. And, uh, you know, but priesthood just didn't work for him. And then a little later on, I saw a girl I remembered from grade school, Trudy Fagenkranz. Now, Trudy uh, was not one of the beauties of our class. And I can remember, uh, mean as we were in grade school, you know, uh, you'd pass her in the hall and the boys would bark. Uh, she was a real dog. And uh, that was where we'd get the message over to her. Then there was a couple, older couple. And uh, they were beauties. They were from a previous parish I've had. And there was absolutely nothing I did that they didn't oppose. No decision I uh, made that they didn't question. And no position I took that they didn't criticize publicly. And they were just, as Paul would say, a thorn in my side. Well, I'm looking at these people and I'm saying to myself, if this is the competition, I might not do too badly when it comes down to the judgments. Well, anyway, gradually, lots of people came in, and uh, there was a bell, and everyone is kind of coming in, squeezing into the rooms, and the doors are closing. And I just get in right next to the wall, and the door closes behind me. 
all of a sudden, a guy comes up uh, right in behind me after the door closed and opened. He said, no, Mike, he said, it's good to see you. And I didn't know the guy from Adam. He said, no, St. Peter, it's good to see you. Glad you're here. Well, I said, somebody knows me. So he went back out, and then he came in that door next to the chair. And he comes in, signals, and everybody's quiet. And all he says is, here's Jesus. And Jesus came in and had a seat. <clears throat> well, we're all waiting for the judgment. And it's just quiet. You can just feel the tension in the room. All of a sudden, Jesus says, Would you please take off your masks? Well, I didn't know if I heard him, so I turned to a lady next to me and said, What did you say? And he was, she was irritated. So he said, Take off your mask. Well, I was really crushed because. You know, it's my uh, habit of reading things halfway, and I said, my God, I never did finish that. Reading the invitation about wearing a mask, I didn't understand. And here it is. My own judgment. And I'm unprepared. But as I looked around, everybody else had read it, I guess, because they knew what they were doing. Sure enough, people are pulling and pulling and they're pulling these masks off. And I look around and my uh, friend from the seminary, he's there and, uh, you know, I look and he pulls off his mask. And there's Jesus. So I look at uh, Trudy Fagenkrantz. Emma, she takes off her mask, and there's Jesus. And the uh, couple from my parish, they're taking off their masks, and I see Jesus. Well, as now, you know, as then, I was upset. And sure enough, St. Peter kind of recognized it, comes over to me and said, Mike, what's wrong with I said, you know, I've blown it. Here it is, my last judgment. And all I can do, you know, is stand here because I didn't understand about this damn mask. He pats me on the shoulder. He said, no, don't worry. Well, but I said, what can I do? Well, he says, why don't you just check? Check to see if you've got a mask. I know I don't. But I just kind of work my finger there on the neck. And sure enough, something starts to come loose. And there I am, pulling and pulling. And something comes off. And I turned to the uh, old mirror in the wall of the ballroom. And there was enough mirror that I could see Jesus. Well, with that, I woke up, and the dream was over, but the message was there. The message that says, Judgment Day is not somewhere else at some other time. Judgment Day is today, right here, and the only judgment that we have is the judgment of whether or not we can live our lives without our masks. So that's a, a sermon. It's a sermon of images. It's a sermon that invites people to begin to deal with the substance of the sermon for themselves to find out where in their lives they have pigeonholed people so that uh, they themselves don't 
to see Christ. And to begin to realize that within our own lives, that there are situations in which we have denied the presence of Christ in ourselves. And it's only in being Christ and seeing Christ that we really have the life of Christ. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk now about uh, preaching in an evangelizing parish. Preaching in such a way that it's an invitation to other people to get right into the sermon. And to be so much of the sermon that when it's over, they can continue to work with it. I've often felt sometimes when the uh, homilist would sit down after preaching, and I'm saying, for God's sake, would you just keep the mass going? You know, it's dying after that sermon. But a sermon like this that addresses the imagination, you need to give them time to begin to plug it in so they can take it somewhere else. I took the same concept and preached another sermon on the Good Shepherd, not this one, but it's Good Samaritan, Good Samaritan sermon. And I actually heard this sermon uh, in graduate school uh, given by an Australian. And as he gave the sermon, uh, he was explaining to us that he was actually Luther, but he was working in a Methodist church as pastor because in uh, Australia, they have ecumenism maybe a step ahead of where we are, and uh, there's a lot of uh, changing about. But he uh, said this is the sermon that he preached on the Good Samaritan story. And to uh, preach it, because I think he came out of England, you almost have to have a vision of the uh, an English town, you know, where there's no... Uh, American four-lane streets and this kind of thing, but the curvy little two-lane streets going through the village. Uh, this is a, like that previous one, an extended metaphor. He said, uh, one uh, afternoon, uh, late in the winter, the shopkeeper was uh, preparing to, uh, you know, close up shop and to go on home for supper. As he did that, he began to uh, look around and say, you know, there's really not much point in keeping this, uh, this shop open any longer because uh, nobody's out. It's raining, cats and dogs. It's getting darker earlier uh, than normal, and that's early enough. Uh, so I'm thinking I'll just uh, pack up and go. So that's exactly what he does. He closes the shop, locks it all up, and, uh, you know, calls home and says, you know, I'm going to be there a little early. So uh, he gets in the car and uh, he realizes a lot of other people are uh, doing the same thing he's doing, closing up, going home. And by the time uh, he's out there in traffic, it's, uh, you know, quite dark and the street lights are on. And sure enough, as uh, everyone's going out of town, kind of bumper to bumper, he notices oh, two or three cars ahead of him, uh, that they're kind of swerving out away from the curb at a certain point. So he's kind of aware of it, and sure enough, he gets up there, and there is something there, and he curves. And in the back of his mind, he's saying to himself, you know, uh, that could have been a, a person there. It was, there's something there. So he pulled around the corner, the next corner, and he came back, and sure enough, it was somebody kind of uh, just rolled up in a blanket and they kind of rolled off the uh, sidewalk and right at the edge of the curb. So he says, uh, I better look and see what this is all about. He shook uh, the blanket, there was a motion, he uncovered, and there was a woman. Obviously she was beaten and quite possibly beaten and then just dumped out of the car. He pulled her up away from the street before anything worse happened to her, put her in the uh, front of the store where there's a little canopy to cover her 
right there at the shop they were in front of. And he says, are you okay? And she's kind of groaning. And he said, you just stay there. I'm going to get the police. Well, with that, she comes alive and says, no, don't call the police. Don't call the police. And he said, well, at least, you know, i got to call you the ambulance. Don't call the ambulance. It's only more trouble. So he is trying to figure out she won't let him do anything. And uh, what can he do? He said, okay, would you at least let me take you to the clinic? where somebody can look at you and see if there's anything serious. And finally, after arguing, she agreed to that. He got his car, came around again, kind of stopped traffic and caused a scene, but he finally got her into the car and takes her to the, uh, takes her to this clinic. And at the clinic, for some reason, uh, while everybody else is going home, uh, people were coming in there left and right. It was really a long line. Finally, after about an hour of wait, he gets back on the phone, calls home, and says, I'm sorry, I know I said I'd be home early. Uh, I might be home really late. Uh, I'll explain it when I get there, go to bed, I'll see you later. Comes back and he waits and he waits another hour, finally, to get in, see the doctor. He comes out finally and talks to the gentleman. He says, she's been really beaten bad. She's almost lost one eye. Uh, she should be in a hospital. We should be calling the police, but she's told me everything. She probably told you, and the best we could do with, you know, without her consent is to simply uh, keep her overnight here, and which we can do for one night, and then uh, we'll get her on her way tomorrow. If it gets worse, then we'll have to take her to the hospital. So he said, okay, can I see her? He said, yes, go ahead. And then he sees her and she thanks him profusely and everything. And, uh, you know, he said, listen, I'll check in tomorrow when I'm coming to work and see just how you're doing. And, you know, if, there, if you need to be taken somewhere, you'll be thinking it overnight so you don't get back in the situation where you're just going to get, uh, you know, abused again. But I'll, I'll check with you. So with that, he went home, got back into his car, and drove home by now. The rain is over, and it's one of those cool, fresh evenings. The rain has ceased, and it's just beautiful. But it's about 11 o'clock at night. So he pulled into his driveway, and uh, he uh, you know, got into the garage, closed everything, got his wet shoes off, tiptoed uh, through the kitchen, up to his room, uh, got his pajamas on, and very quietly uh, climbed into bed next to the man that he loved. So the question that comes out of that is, who is the Samaritan? In our lives today. Who is the person that we believe God cannot work through because God does not love? And where in my life am I now called to work to recognize the presence of Christ? in ways that I've never worked before. So it was a very simple story with a punchline, with a powerful question at the end. And I've always uh, been concerned with the Good Samaritan story because there is no way in 21st century America that we can understand the hatred of Jesus' audience for that Samaritan person. So you have to come up with something else that will catch the imagination. Because when I say to you, the Samaritan was hated by the Jew, nobody's blood is boiling or stirred. But presenting it 
in his narrative gets us to that point where we're stirred and we're forced to deal with the message of Scripture. Well, that's all I want to say, except on the back of the blue, you'll see what we gave out at all of our workshops to people at those workshops on the evangelizing parish. And we tried to put it together in this way. Evangelization is an invitation in word and relationship by a community of faith to discover in my life grace, the presence of God who is already here. Evangelization calls me to conversion, transformation, to allow God's life to reign in my heart so that I might participate in Christ's mission to establish God's reign of justice and peace in the world. So I just simply end by pointing out to you at some point today, go back to uh, the white sheet. Look at those uh, goals that we had for our uh, time together and uh, evaluate it. And even more important than evaluating me, ask yourself, uh, what difference does it make for me? Thank you very much. Here.